John, John has this word uh, called reinventio, um, which is this idea of, of reinventing and discovering, um, you know, perennial things. Uh, um, and, uh, and then I wrote this article recent, or a while ago called, uh, We Need a Renaissance, not, not a Revolution. So I wonder if you guys could perhaps riff on, on this idea of, uh, well, what do you think of my idea that that re Renaissance is more appropriate to the time than than, than revolution, and that's what we need to be doing uh, for the future? And then maybe we can, we can talk a bit more about um, the religion that is not a religion, um, or John's idea, and 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 maybe your idea of concrete utopia, and maybe uh, maybe we can go deeper into the ideas of education and and that sort of thing. Um, it, that sounds good. I mean, the, the term is actually from Kerry, his book on Augustine. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and he says he wants to use, he wanted to use, uh, it, it comes out in English and he's unhappy with the English translations. It's Augustine's invention of the inner self. And he said the word he wanted was Latin, but the, the publishers wouldn't let him use it. The word is inventio, which means both, it means both to invent and to discover. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, 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 I'm very interested in that as a replacement term for the term that I was always unhappy with, the idea of sort of salvaging from the past. Mm. Um, and that's well, why can, I, I, can I just say one more thing before you continue? The, the reason I thought this concept was important is because I asked myself the question, what do we need to reinventio? It's hard to say that. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, oh, and, and, and it occurs to me everything. We need to reinvent practically everything. I mean, in terms of institutions, but at the same time, we don't want to give, you know, we want to salvage, I, I, to use your word again, yeah. what matters or, or, or what, what, you know, the, the, uh, the perennial, and, and Zach talks about neo-perennialism. Um, well, so, I, I mean, I like, I, I like, in fact, what you're doing with that idea, Andrew, how you've taken it up as let's go through various, some central normative constructs and uh, see, if, you know, if the inventio is, is uh, required and then what that looks like. I'm, I'm very interested in that project. We've been doing it, you and Chris and I, and I'd, I'd like yeah. to continue with that. Um, and um, I'm also interested in um, the, uh, the thing you propose. I, I've been contrasting the Axial Revolution with the French Revolution and some of the things I've been talking about. Um, and that mm -hmm. what we need is something more like the Axial Revolution than the French Revolution. And mm -hmm. that sounds like it could at least be put into constructive dialogue with your idea of uh, Renaissance versus revolution. Yeah, and, and the other, sorry to keep jumping in here, but the other I, uh, the other uh, thing that I thought that we could reinventio, I have a really hard time saying that, reinventio, um, is it, because it's it's such a concern of, of Zach's is how we think about, you know, social justice and that kind of thing. I thought that might be a interesting way to go. I'd like to talk about way that. Way to go. Who can bring uh, care and concern to it uh, yeah. because, um, it seems to me right now that the discourse around social justice is becoming uh, very oversimplified and it's either being what's currently happening. Uh, I think, and the fact that some people even take this as an insult is kind of telling. I think what's happening right now with the social justice movement is we're actually seeing it's, it's, it's a religion much more than it's just a political movement uh, because it's, it's, it's serving a lot of functions that religion serves. And I'd like to talk about um, what like, with Zach, I guess, about what that might mean. Like, what it, what does it mean in terms of the, the broader idea that we've been already talking about? About well, the reinventio of education and the uh, the deeper connections between education and enculturation, um, and between education and virtue. And we've talked to also, you know, the connections between education and the mythopoetic discourse, both between people and within people. I think the pursuit of justice without the pursuit of Sofferson is a grave mistake. Um, and so it seems to me like one of the places that we're supposed to mediate and moderate between those two is education. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot I'd like to talk Can about. Can you remind me what Sofferson is, what that term means? Sofferson is the untranslatable, one of the four cardinal Greek virtues. Oh. And, and like wisdom, you can make a good case that Sofferson is actually more of a meta virtue than a virtue but it's, it's, it's often paired with justice. Uh, Plato famously does it in the Republic, where he talks about justice in the city, and it's reflected in terms of this state within the psyche, uh, a kind of inner justice, right. and it's Sofferson. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of a, a culture of the psyche so that it is 
reliably self-organizing to pursue what is good and what is true and what is beautiful. That kind right. of idea. Mm -hmm. Totally. And that's why the, the paideia or the basic educational structure of the polity is so primary. Uh, Cause yeah, you could, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you could set up uh, on the books, just system. Uh, let's say, you know, basic income and universal health care and all my social miracles, let's say, but you end up not fixing the problem with uh, digital media ecology and not fixing the problem with education. And you get this kind of uh, total fragmentation of awareness and removal from the grounding of, of uh, I, can't, I won't even be able to say the word, but of wisdom basically within the individual person. Yeah. And that's where it's all off. And that's where the issue with the discussion of justice and education comes together, which was the theme of my first book. But, you know, a lot of what we're seeing with uh, kind of uprising um, and the so-called social justice warriors, you know, m most of this has to do with this context of socialization and especially the informational technologies in which individuals Actually, are socialized and regulate self-esteem more than it has to do with concepts of justice. Yeah. <laughs> like if we could get into Rawlsian justice and, Plotinus's notions of justice, and then you can look at justice even in Buddhism and other discourses. They don't use that term, but there are ways of thinking about it. Those are very different from the in kind of personality complexes uh, and character structures that are being formed in these socialization environments of uh, informational, like digital informational ecologies. And um, well, yeah, well, I was going to say like it, it, like. Part of what I mean by it being a religious phenomena is one of the things religions do is they tend to generate um, normative claims. They generate, they tend to generate new virtues often, right? Like, you know, uh, Christianity makes love and faith into virtues and they weren't before. We now take it for granted. But, you know, Thomas Aquinas has to write a large piece on it, trying to explain why love is a virtue and, and etc. And so I think we're, like we're very, we're, I think we're close, and it's in a, in a way that's concerning to me, to, to outrage becoming a virtue, and this ties into what you're saying, Zach, because we know. I mean, sorry, I, I don't mean to. I, I'm, I'm generally not conspiratorial at all, but we know the algorithms on social media polarize people and drive them to outrage and to extreme statements and to clip reasoning because that promotes right connection and advertising and viewing etc cetera, etc cetera. and people i think this is what you're alluding to with social media people are being you know they're being educated in a very profound way um, into um, a way of being in which outrage seems like a virtuous thing um, and i'm not clear uh, that outrage is should ever be considered a candidate virtue this is completely independent about what the issue the outrage is directed at. Yeah. I think there's relevant issues, important issues. I'm not denying that at all. That's not what I'm talking about. I want to make that really clear. I'm talking about the promotion within sort of a religious framework of outrage as a virtue. Like I, I, the people will often say to me in conversations and they'll say it sort of critically, is like, aren't you outraged about this? And I'll say, well, I have arguments against it. And I, th you know, but they're they're upset with me because I'm not outraged, and that's that's the phenomenon I'm putting my finger on right now. I, I just have a thought here, just uh, just to give another another perspective, because I was listening to the Jewish rabbi and he was talking. He was saying all these people are they're out in the street looting and stuff, destroying things, you know, uh, because of their their outrage. Um, why wouldn't they do that if they don't have a proper? Uh, basic religious education. That's what the, the rabbi was saying. You know, why wouldn't they do that if they didn't have any idea of, of uh, any refined idea of, 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 of what is, you know, what is virtue? So that's just, I agree with what you're saying. I just, I just, that other, that, that, that this is tying into to Zach's idea that, you know, that we, we need, we need uh, to, to, to bring sort of, um, not religio back into education or um, mm -hmm. both of you guys idea, I think. Right. I mean, and it's, I would say something more like the, you know, social media is hijacking 
the power of religion, yes. essentially, mm-hmm. that they, you know, religion is the ultimate psyop, right? It's the ultimate limbic system, neocortical integration, like capture. Uh-huh. And it, people. Yeah. And, and it's always promoted violence to some extent. <laughs> if like, yeah. So there needs to be, and I think what, what, you know, Facebook and other outlets have done is basically found a way to get, you know, as far as I can tell, like um, almost randomly generated religious fervor <laughs> and scapegoating dynamics in particular. Yeah, random. It's, it's random, right? That's that's the thing. It's uh, well, it's it's say. it's not entirely random. Not entirely. You know? random. And again, I'm with right. John. Where I'm like, I can talk mm. just social justice all day. Like, I'm yeah. actually very. Uh, sincerely concerned about society not because it's about to self-terminate in terms of existential and ecological collapse but in because of the injustices that have been mm-hmm. perpetrated yeah. especially yeah. in the past yeah. 20 50, or 15 years so there's a long conversation to have there so it's a, it's a I'm, distraction I'm, from actual social justice yes, it's a distraction it's, it's from like a, I it's actually like think a, it's a smoke screen i think it's a smoke screen being run in between us yeah. it's like a simulacrum of social justice or something right. or a simulacrum of religion or or, or yeah well, and it was like uh, Michael White, who was one of the organizers of the Occupy movement, wrote a book, The End of Protest. I talk about a lot because it's brilliant. And he was like, listen, at a certain point, the thing, Occupy, became, it started to function for its own representation in the social media field, right? Which is to say, like, you weren't doing it to do it. You were doing it to repre- re-represent it into the social media field as a as a signal, you know? And uh and so that's part of the dynamic here is that there's, yeah, the simulations layered on top of the actual reality and often makes the actual reality less less real, less important. So people are like abandoning sanity for the sake of signaling allegiance to, you know, meta narratives propagated mm-hmm. through the social media field. Um, which, which sort of is, is a Girardian phenomenon, right? It's like, it's like these, these mobs develop and they look for a scapegoat, uh, you know, and the scapegoat is sort of random and, uh, you know, and they prop the scapegoat up and, and uh, you know, sacrifice him and then make him into a God of, of some, some kind. Yeah, and, and so the I mean the general takeaway is like, you know, the first move has to be something about that. <laughs> like the first move actually has to be reclaiming the basic foundations that allow us to communicate, right? Um, which is to say, kind of rolling back the colon the colonization of the life world. To roll back the colonization of the life world and create actual sane and fair containers for socialization and intergenerational transmission because the social justice thing, social justice warriors, quote unquote, it's also generational. Understand that, you know, you're looking at young people. Um, you're looking at young people who are um, being used strategically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, so it's, it's a disconcerting situation and uh I agree. There's a sense of religiosity and, f- and religious f- kind of fervor to it, um, which I attribute to the kind of exquisite uh, advertising and algorithmical capacity of the social media platforms, because uh, they've they they know the right as advertisers do. They know exactly the right set of words, right? The simple abstract mappings, a couple abstract concepts next to one another, with a certain word sound power that just is on a poster and it just, who started that? Good question. (laughs) Like where do these things begin and how do they propagate through the social media field and become attachable to the self, brought up into the self's self-esteem regulation, self-understanding. And now you're running a kind of modus operandi for your life where your representation of yourself in social media is the actual basis of your self-esteem and your immediate lived and your immediate, your immediate lived environment is not the basis where you're getting your self-esteem. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, that's the total capture of the self-system by the kind of attention harvesting um, information capitalism or surveillance capitalism. Uh, that's the most egregious because it's not just that overstimulation and capture of like through hyperstimuli of the limbic system. It's also capture of the self-esteem regulation mechanism and identity formation mechanism uh, through that kind of signaling and, and like... Uh, you know, pseudo diet, pseudo, uh, what's the right word? Pseudo attachment or, or pseudo recognition system that the social media kind of puts up as a mirror. Um, 
So anyway, I kind of kept going there, but <laughs> I think that I wanted to get that stuff out. That's good. That's good. It was good, Zach. It was good. I, yeah. I mean, that's that's the. I mean, the, the part you ended on, it circles back to the concern I have, right? That, but when when you when you sever the virtues from each other, you tend to get what one of the things you get is you get the confusion of having a self representation with actually being in the process of, of self knowledge, and. and um, like we have to remember that, you know, people getting trained in these patterns of behavior and, and that are ultimately manipulated outside of their self-knowledge, they can be directed other ways, right? That, 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 uh, this machine, the fact that it might be directed towards causes that you and I believe in right now, doesn't mean that this machine can't be equally directed towards causes that we, we think are like, wrong. And that, that, that's my concern. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I have no faith in corporate capitalism to keep my best interests at heart. I have no faith in that whatsoever. And so that, that's what I mean. Of, I'm concerned about uh, the, the, the fact that the, the powers that be are just sort of, you know, just uh, there's the uncritical sort of, this is just a wonderful thing that's happening. And it's like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about what we're, what we're teaching people. Uh, about how to try and bring about change, uh, because um, I, I always worry about, especially when I see the corporate capitalist people just jumping on board this and loving it and saying it's good and like that. That also makes me like, why are you doing this? You're, yeah. you're, you're not you're not you're not doing this for any moral argument. You're doing yeah. this, you're benefiting from this in some way, and and so again, I don't. I generally have a heuristic of not going anywhere towards conspiracy theories. But I think the idea that this has layers of causation below it that the, that the demonstrators are not aware of and that those layers can be put to uh, other ends that could turn out to be what I would regard as seriously immoral. Um, yeah. that's, a, that's a very deep concern I have. It's a bit what, what Daniel Schmachtenberg always talks about is, is, true, is something true becomes weaponized, right? It's, it's something that. something is something that is maybe a beautiful expression becomes a corporate logo or a, a, you know it's that and it's my overall concern right that the the thing that one of the most powerful biases that keeps us from being rational is to find the products of our cognition super salient and not be concerned with attend to or value the processes by which we try to achieve our goals. I mean, that's 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 both that's an argument that comes out of sort of deep philosophical tradition and you know overwhelming, I think, empirical recent empirical work and experimental work, and that. So I have a concern that that, as I said, we're not paying attention to how are we like what is going on such that we're doing these things that we're doing. I, it's a very Socratic concern, and, and, and it's a difficult thing to bring up because I do think it's clear there is police brutality. It's, it's clear the police have to be demilitarized. I mean, and, and Zach and I have been talking about this before, and I've been talking about it for a long time. He's, of course, talked about it more eloquently. Our culture as a whole should be shifting its resources into education in ways we, we haven't been doing. I, I think these are important in things that have to be pursued. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem I have is I try to talk to people about uh, it's an important part of problem solving is to make sure you have formulated the problem well. And I'm not sure the problem has been formulated well. And I'm even afraid to bring that criticism up. I can, you know, I, yeah. I can say, look, I, I, I think your goals are right, but the way you're formulating trying to achieve those goals is exactly thwarting you from achieving them. And so that's the concern. But these people actually become beyond criticism because because they are they, they are in a state of, of religious uh, fanaticism. You know, so you, you can't you can't go into a, a, a de in depth analysis because it's 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 an article of faith, isn't it, when when people talk about these things. Uh, well I mean what? I I don't I don't know about all the people that are involved. I don't know how to yeah. I don't know there's no data and I don't want to pronounce on all of them. I'm only talking about sort of what I think what Zach and I are talking about, the, the way in which 
what's sort of the, the I, I want, what do I want to say? I want to see the media presence, what, like the, the, the complicit thing that's going on between the media and some of the demonstrators and some of the speakers on behalf of the movement. That's what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. I, I imagine there's large numbers of people there that are there, you know, out of genuine motive and are trying, and trying I don't, I don't want to. I, no, I, don't I wasn't think. really pronouncing on, on the demonstrators or the or the issues. I was more pronouncing on a certain kind of uh, fanaticism that doesn't uh, doesn't allow for for um, any kind of uh, you know mistake or, or you know of speech or um, uh, you know or, or wrong view or, or you know so we can't have a conversation when when it's it's just. It's, it's so but that's yeah, totally. You can't have a conversation and that, yeah. but that's true across the board. It's not just, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not true for those people like, who are protesting. It's right. true for the, the whole, the like, whole spectrum of yeah, people. Right. And, and so that's, again, I think back to the kind of social media, digital kind of informational landscape, you know, it's, it's running interference on our ability to be together and to stay in the space of reasons as opposed to retreat to strategic relationship to one another. Uh, and so, yeah, words are kind of the first possible weapons and justice is of course, one of those beautiful words, which is now like sometimes used pejoratively, like the social justice word, it's pejorative, you know, yeah. like, and justice itself, as I said, is a philosophical concept huge moment of truth there massive important world historical moment of truth <laughs> in the elaboration and sophistication of reasoning about the nature of justice this is just the case in moral development piaget colberg when you yeah, look at the, yeah. the nature of socialization and perspective taking capacity and the insights into the into the kind of the deep structure of the social world uh, ideas of fairness and uh things of that nature all true right and as you're saying, Schmachtenberger hit it on the head that it's exactly because it's true. There's a moment of truth nestled in there that you can layer all of this other stuff on, uh, which ends up turning that truth into something that's weaponizable in the sense of that you can create scapegoating dynamics around it and multipolar traps in social media fields. Which and, is counterproductive. Again, I've been thinking about this word counterproductive. It also relates to the iotrogenic plague or you know counterproductive medicine counterproductive social justice counterproductive school counterproductive so many things um have become counterproductive in in our institutions and and um yeah and then and, and again michael white and it's it was demonstrated back with the uh the big you know world trade organization protests like quebec and the battle in seattle and those things like the medium of protest itself has largely been captured through intelligence upgrades within police and military operations and other sectors and so and non -American. including advertising so it's it's a kind of advertisement right isn't it well it's not just that it's a kind of advertising it's that there's we just know for example that one of the ways occupy wall street was taken down was just by putting undercover cops in there who disrupted consensus-based processing Mm -hmm. Right. So a group of hippies trying to get together, save the world. They're going to run the whole thing on consensus based processing. And you put one undercover cop in there and he just doesn't agree to anything and nothing moves. Right. You can't decide where to march because this guy. So that's a benign example of other activities that we know have basically captured uh, and then money being routed in from all sides to keep certain movements alive and to specifically empower certain organizers as opposed to other organizers. And this is well documented as a part yeah. of what protest culture has yeah. become. I don't want to talk too political here, but I, I remember something about in Russia that, that Putin was, he was funding both sides, <laughs> the sides that was against him and, and the yeah. side that was for him. And he was funding them both because he knew that by getting people all worked up, they, they, they would just become distracted and, and uh, that way he could keep keep power. Right. You know, yeah. and uh, large foreign governments wouldn't structure that's keeping existing protest movements and civil distress going in the United States is naive. Like we know China, for example, does amazing unconventional warfare. Um, uh, so, so it's just this question of looking past the surface running the hermeneutics of suspicion, which is part of the social justice 
Zing is running a hermeneutics of suspicion. Run the hermeneutics of suspicion on your own shit <laughs> and start looking more deeply into the, the many layers of what's actually unfolding as opposed to what might be unfolding. And again, I, I'm arguing not that the injustice doesn't exist. I'm arguing that the media spectacle is actually running a screen between us and the actual injustices and the actual ways to get in there and start to do things about them. And it begins with having civil conversations and engaging in collective inquiry about our shared reality, um, which means finding the space of reason again uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, moving back from that retreat into pure strategic action. And the worst place we're seeing the strategic action is in the intergenerational transmission, right? And this, I've spoken about this before, but like mm. uh, the difference between raising children and designing children and yeah. what advertising does is design children. Facebook is designing children. It's not raising them. Yeah, it's so ugly. Raising yeah. a child is a non-strategic relationship of communicative action, mutual understanding. Uh, designing a child is a strategic intervention. Hmm. You require words um, in the sense of even trying to establish mutual understanding. Uh, and so that's part of what we're seeing here is actually for a certain threshold of generational transmission, there was this much higher incidence of purely strategic interaction as the main event during childhood development and socialization, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, that, that, that kind of disables the capacity for uh, non-strategic interaction um, and would actually make one deeply suspicious of anyone who wasn't acting strategically because you'd think it was just some higher level strategy. <laughs> oh, uh, okay, and yeah. uh, so. That's so interesting. Now, I think I've, I've lost deep, you. Uh, you're, you're cutting out a bit, unfolding. Zach. Um, are, you, are you experiencing Zach cutting out a bit or is that just me, uh, John? No, uh, he's also cutting out for me. You're, you're cutting out just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So That's been um, happening lately. maybe you could just re repeat the last thing you said because it, it, it was very interesting and, and uh, I was, I was basically saying that I believe, and this is a hypothesis, but give me some years and we'll see what's happening. But I believe that there's been a situation such that at a certain point in time, maybe 2016, maybe 2010, the predominant communicational context in which socialization was occurring in the United States became more strategic than not, which is to say that the main experience I'm having of other people is that they're relating to me strategically. <laughs> mm. including my own family teachers and especially this screen that i'm looking at all day um, mm -hmm. and it becomes so normal that you don't realize that there's a space of non-strategic communication right uh, where the unforced force of the better argument where mutual agreement and mutual understanding are primary and content is sometimes secondary and a whole bunch of other factors which make for healthy socialization environment where you can regulate self-esteem in a, in, a, in a way that's mediated through the embodied experiences of people around you and things of that nature. Um, and so, yeah, the idea that when social media started to tip towards one of the main effects of socialization and identity formation, you also got a tipping towards the main environment of identity formation being one that's strategic, an environment of design, as opposed mm -hmm. to an environment in which one's being raised. Uh, so that means beyond a certain threshold, generational threshold, there's a massive kind of like opening in the character structure uh, for, for something like infection or manipulation yeah. by social, complex social media fields. Um, and it's a strange hypothesis, but it's one of the only ways that I can explain what's happening. And the more you look at the nature of social media and realize what an engineered environment it is like just how uh just how complex the psychometric micro targeting becomes and just, just how, how easily it captures you how just how dedicated they were to figuring out how to capture you yeah not like people like you you <laughs> uh yeah. you realize it's, it's a deeply uh you know deeply kind of it's what well, deep is not the right word it's profoundly unprecedented context of socialization for humans because it's it's um usually not the case like usually the most of the modality you're having in communication is non-strategic right it's trust-based and relational and embodied with mm -hmm. family members or 
members of your community. Now, in rare situations like warfare or serious abuse, or maybe you're in a, like a really bad orphanage. I mean, I don't, there's definitely scenarios where it would be different. You feel like everyone's strategically relating to you <laughs> and manipulating you. Uh, but to have, you know, so I'm just, it's, it's one of the things that takes me back and makes me worry uh, when I see the kind of degradation of discourse and the weaponization of language and the kind of like use of almost advertising grade communicative tricks by mm -hmm. young people in social media fields to get a point, to get across like complex ideas that they haven't actually thought through that they're signaling allegiance to a meta narrative to, you know, signal group membership. Uh, but they're running very sophisticated <laughs> yeah. like media tropes, which they are just second nature to them because of the context of their socialization where you're not reasoning, you're advertising constantly. Like, mm. you know, you're not relating, you're strategizing. So what's the way out of the matrix? Uh, like, uh, you know, I brought up this idea of a renaissance and you talked about stepping back. Um, we have to step back on some level, right? We have to, we have to rediscover um, our neighborhood and like repurpose, you know, all this garbage we create and. Um, and some things I think, I mean, part of, part, uh, a piece I would first of all add to what Zach was saying. Uh, the reason why I was silent is because I was in complete agreement with it and hmm. thought it was very eloquently expressed. I think there's added dimensions. I mean, so Sloman's work on the knowledge illusion, I think is, like, I think it's put on amphetamines by social media. So the knowledge illusion is people regularly confuse access to knowledge with possession of knowledge. Mm -hmm. They deeply confuse it. They think they know when they don't. And, you, and, and, and it's actually kind of a shocking thing to do with people. Like you ask people, you know what, how a bicycle works? And they're, oh yeah, of course I do, very confidently. And then you say, wow. okay, well draw a picture of a bicycle and show, it, it will explain to me how it works. And they start doing it and they realize they have no idea how a bicycle works or a toilet. And what's interesting is when you trans this, translate this over into social interaction, when you ask people to state their values on an issue, they polarize. But when you ask them to explain the mechanisms of the issue that is at work, they actually move towards agreeing with each other and understanding each other. So, right, if I ask, you know, what's the Republican take on this or the Democratic take? people will go on this. But if you ask, huh. if you actually ask people, but well, what are the causes of poverty? Don't, I don't, uh, you know, not what you think we should do about it, but what are the causes of it? What are the processes? And then what happens is people realize that their ignorance is much more shared than, the, and they move towards, right, uh, actually coming to have an empathetic understanding of other people. But the problem with social media is it, it takes the knowledge illusion and explodes it because people are being educated, right, to believe that their access to the internet is the same thing as having knowledge. And we, and that seems so innocent because we're, we're thinking, oh, but it's like, it's just like a, an electronic library. But no, it's not, it's not, right? It, mm. it, it's, it's overwhelmingly not, it really puts, because in a library you have to go and search, you have to gather things together, you have to put a lot of thought in, you have to talk to other people. The internet, it's got everything organized for you. It's got so, algorithms. You're invaded by algorithms, right? Right. And so you see what I'm saying? It, it magnifies the knowledge illusion. And, and this is, again, what, and then if you take that and you put that with what Zach's saying about how people are basically, I would call it a kind of modal confusion, that they're into uh, manipulating each other rather than uh, the deep recognition that we become persons through each other, a kind of a gapic notion that has been lost. Uh, when you put those two together, when people think they know uh, when they don't, and they think they don't need people when they do, uh, I, I mean, then you're, you're, in, you're into a very, very dangerous situation because people will then make, they will have, it, it's, like, it's, it's like the line from Yates, right, uh, about, you know, the, 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 the passionate intensity uh, for, for things that um, are actually uh, very, very questionable. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is I think that, well, I propose 
that we need to get back to a way of thinking about discourse that integrates self-knowledge, the creation of personhood, and the exploration of, uh, 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 of deep understanding back together. And that's what I'm trying to do with the whole dialectic dialogos project. That's why I think this project is central, because teaching people that speech can be a place in which human being, personhood, that, that and also selfhood, right? I mean, this is the Socratic idea that that you're knowing yourself. If you if you think if you're prejudiced to believe, because I think it's a kind of prejudice that we've enculturated, that self knowledge is basically an act that's achieved through introspection, or as as Zach says, through self representation. Whereas the the Socratic thing is no no. Self-knowledge is revealed only in discourse with others because that it's only there where it becomes clear what you are committed to and what you actually know. And so I'm trying to argue for, that's, what I, that's why I, this project that I've been pursuing so deeply, and I, this is why I think I want to put it into dialogue with what Zach's proposing about education. I think of the attempt to reverse engineer reinventio theologos is central to everything we're talking about here because we have taken all of these functions and we've pulled them apart and then we've made ourselves prey to manipulation and to knowledge illusion and to modal confusion and to confusing self-representation with self-knowledge and self-transformation and so i think that with reintegrating speech communitas, transformation, aspiration. I, that's why I, I, I think this is central. And I think this is a project very different from the projects that are usually labeled political in our current discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd go. Sorry, sorry that was a bit yeah. of a speech. How do we, no, how, how can I we agree. even be political? I have a hard time being political myself. I am Zach, I guess this, you said you were radicalized because of circumstances and, and you, so you totally, you, but I went, I went, got medical. into it because, because, but I, you know, I almost feel like I'm, I'm, I almost feel like an irresponsible person because I, I, I don't know where to put my foot in the, in the political world. Uh, um, I have an I mean, exact, I, I speak about uh, I speak about meta politics and what yeah. what John's describing uh, with the Dialogos project uh, uh, is absolutely meta political movement. It, it is political, and maybe in a sense, it's deeper right? than it's, it's, it's changing. Not, it's not superficial it, politics, but it's deep politics. On but it's it's changing what could be even possible in the realm of politics. Exactly. Prior, okay, that's great. Prior yeah. to politics, it's 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 kind of like politics quote unquote, is the space where we hash out things according to certain rules. The metapolitical is where we are enabling ourselves to change the nature of those rules that we call political. So like right now, political action is entirely strategic action. And, you know, sociopaths rise through the ranks <laughs> as do yeah. you get in business. And so the question would be like, if that's politics, then we need to change the nature of politics, but you can't do that using politics as usual. You have to go metapolitical, which is why every time there's a kind of civilizational turnover, there's a tremendous amount of work at the level of personhood, education, yes. you know, dialogos. Well, that's why I think we're not in a revolutionary time. We're in a time of renaissance of kind of, we need to rediscover our humanity on some level because we've been so damaged by the, the you know, the state of things. Well, that's why I've been proposing the model of the, uh, and I, if you guys know my work, I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm not, not being anachronistic. So I'm taking it as. I'm not trying to get back to it. But I'm proposing that we that we should be thinking about something like the Axial Revolution rather than the French Revolution as the model we should be considering. Uh, because uh, what happens in the Axial Revolution uh, through the permeation of all of the new psychotechnologies is entirely new. The, the cultural cognitive grammar has changed. So new ways of human being and new ways of human religion and new ways of human wisdom and new ways of human spirituality become possible for us. And um, 
that's where I think we need to go right now, because I think the issues mm -hmm. we're facing are, 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 I think they're even more profound than what was going on. I know what you're trying to say, Andrew, about the Renaissance, but I think the issues we're facing are, it's, it's a much more significant transition we might be going through right now. Even more than the Renaissance, a, a greater, a greater transition. Well, I mean, the Renaissance is wrestling with a lot of things. It's wrestling with, you know, it's wrestling with, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the corruption and decline of the Catholic Church. It's wrestling with the rediscovery of Aristotelian science. It's wrestling with the rediscovery of Neoplatonic magic, uh, which, by the way, eventually gets taken up into advertising. Uh, yeah. So that's a weird uh, history uh, of its own. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, but I think I guess I'm more thinking of the essence of the word Renaissance, like rebirth, rather than rather than the specific uh, m moment. Uh, I, um, I, 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 I guess that's what I'm because I'm not you know I'm not a historian and, and but I think what, I guess what I want to what I want to emphasize the difference is although there was a lot of stuff sort of maybe falling apart uh, you know on the cusp of the Renaissance uh, I think we're under much more threat uh, of, uh, of a much more comprehensive mm. kind of disaster and collapse. Um, and so uh, that's why I think of, you know, the, the way people sort of come out of the Bronze Age collapse um, in the Axial Revolution, it, it, it might be more helpful. I don't know. It's, it's hard to know. Zach is right. This is, what we're in is very historically unprecedented. And so we have to take these historical models very carefully. We shouldn't be really attached to them. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I've been I've been trying to think of a few because there's the the Renaissance and then that circuitous route through to the Enlightenment and the Thirty Years' War in that period, which was the overthrow of the ancient regime and the birth of capitalism, yeah. nation state, all that stuff. That they, and then there were hegemonic turnovers within the history of capitalism, right from the from the Dutch. Uh, well, first from the Jewanese or the Italians to the Dutch, then the British, then the United States. So there's most. So, well, is it like the lead up to World War One when it went from the British to the United States and this capitalist hegemon? Well, it's bigger than that. Is it as big as the turnover of the ancient regime into the you know end of the feudal period, beginning of the capitalist period? That one seems pretty resonant, but now you're saying, well, maybe it's like the collapse of the Bronze Age, right? Yeah. And the beginning of the Axial Revolution, yeah. which is an even deeper thing. And then you could even ask the question, well, is it actually as significant as uh, when humans first began to use language, right? Yeah, is really that, I was thinking about that too. Yeah. Is it yeah. that deep or is it as significant as the emergence of, you know, multicellular organisms from single cellular? <laughs> Just wow. saying like at what kind of evolutionary <laughs> transition are we actually in? And the digital is pretty weird and we've gone completely planetary right and high technology probably is even higher than we know because of all the you know dark money and you know multiple ongoing manhattan projects have been going on for the past 20 years so like this the chance that we're actually at a much more profound evolutionary mode as opposed to like historical mode sometimes is one of the things that resonates with me and then i go kind of religious transhumanist and begin to reflect on the radical, radical possibilities of personhood that may end up having to be actualized during this during this time. Because Do you want to go into that a little bit? That that's that's you were talking a little bit. You were talking about that with with Jim Rutt. You were talking about. Um, you know, well, I mean, it, it's what is, what's the expression you use? Transhuman um, religious. Uh, I, I say religious transhumanism, just religious because transhumanism. Of, you know, much of the transhumanist discussions, like Kurzweil and and others. You know, that there's actually an eschatological religious flavor to what they're talking about anyway. Oh, yeah. mm. The nature of the artificial intelligence overlords or whatever they are, and then, you know, moving our consciousness into silicon mainframes and, and these kinds of things, or even the radical kind of kind of biohacking life extension to achieve physical immortality. Um these you know getting beyond the human ending but that's all sort of a perversion isn't it i mean that's all this is what i'm saying i'm saying let's put our religious cards actually on the table <laughs> and if we're going to speculate about you know um futures for the species that actually involve the self-transformation of the species into a new species right 
Christ was talking about that, <laughs> right? A lot of religious figures were talking about in yeah. some way that there's a that there's a there's a person hidden within our person that's greater than any person that we've ever known. There's there's a there's a there's a spiritual quantum leap. Right, um, a spiritual quantum leap. That's good. I think about the uh, television show Quantum Leap, but but it <laughs> but it is, a bit cheesy it is perhaps, a good but... phrase. That's the idea that there's, a, <laughs> there's like an acute evolutionary possibility, yeah. um, and that you know Tilliard and Norbindo would say things like you know that the great religious figures have been evolutionary outliers, messengers from the future, as it were, um, showing what's possible at the root of the human personhood, and so. Yeah, Barbara Marks, Huther, Barbara Marks Hubbard and others, you know, that merger of high technology, complete planetization and radical existential risk. It's a pretty rich cocktail <laughs> for, you know, being being kind of, you know, it's a request from evolution for the human to potentially radically, radically change. Um, and in that sense, then we're in a situation now that we, we don't actually understand what exactly our situation is. That you can read it on historical analogies, but we're actually in the middle of something so big that we couldn't know. Like it's, 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 uh, and that doesn't mean we can't act. We actually can. And there's a whole thing to say about that, how to act, even though you don't have total clarity. Um, but in a sense, I think there's a certain recognition we have to have that, yeah, we, we don't know. And we actually can't, we can't know. Okay. So where, how do we act from that place of, of unknowing? I mean, I think it has to do with care, I think. Like it has to do with moving back down to where actual certainty exists. You know, like my love for my wife, I'm pretty certain of this. Like, you know, whether or not we're in some major evolutionary transformation into a, <laughs> you know, I'm not certain of that in any way, like, but the certainty for the love for my wife, right? Um, in concrete situations, I can be certain about what the right thing to do is. In abstract conversation, it's hard to be certain. Um, and there are definitely moral dilemmas where it's not clear what the right thing to do is. But there's plenty of cases <laughs> where you where you know where you where there's a there's a kind of a base certainty at the level of the life world that's given. Um, so long as we're in the space of reason and not strategically acting, then it gets muddy. Um, so in a sense, when you're wandering in the wilderness ontologically, in terms of the meta narratives that make sense for orienting, uh, you can you can move you back. You come to the local. To the you can return to the local, which isn't a turn to the particular or the relative, <laughs> because the universal is actually hidden uh, in, in these local, uh, remember I've used that phrase, anthro-ontological common sense, right? That there's a, that there's a deep-seated capacity to orient together around things that are true and to treat one another uh, in certain ways in light of that. Mm -hmm. um, so those things, I think we're still in that realm of certainty, um, uh, you know, disingenuous scientific arguments that try to diffuse that certainty with like arguments about neurological determinism uh, and nihilistic materialism, trying to undercut what we know from anthropological excuse me, anthro-ontological common sense trying to undercut that. But those are, those are not good arguments <laughs> There's because science relies on, on the ability to actually be in the space of reason and not strategically relate to one another if you're actually doing science. So the snake eats its tail and we're given the life world in which we can care for one another. Um, and from that, we can create tremendous knowledge and do remarkable inquiry. Um, but uh, I'm not going to override that in order to signal some allegiance to some meta narrative, um, you know, I'm going to ground in that and then explore meta narrative from a basis of, of care, this temple that I can bring with me everywhere. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine is writing a book uh, and he calls it the wealth of neighborhoods instead of the wealth of nations. Um, it's like, and, and, the, and the idea is there's, there's so much in your neighborhood, like just in your local neighborhood, there's so much, for example, garbage that could be repurposed or, um, I don't know. There's so much. There's so much you could do with your intimate near world. Um, I don't know if I'm oversimplifying your your, your argument here, but well, look, I, I would like to. I think uh, I have a slightly different take on this. I think it's ultimately convergent, but but because I think I think we 
are in a situation like where it's plausible that we, yeah, that we're facing something more like an evolutionary change because of complexity um, and because of the emergence of AI, these two things and they're, and they're synergistically operating together, they're going to put a demand on us to change our conception of human design, uh, what that fundamentally means. So my recommendation for this, uh, in the, uh, and I, I don't think this is in competition for what, what, what Zach is proposing, but I propose that we put a lot more emphasis on our capacity uh, of adaptivity, that we get a deeper understanding of what that actually is. That's what a lot of my work around relevance realization has been about. What is our capacity for adapting uh, and evolving? Get a deeper, so I mean this is, this is to my mind, a, a kind of scientific take on the Socratic idea of self-knowledge, which is not autobiographical knowledge. It's about knowing your capacities. It's knowing the, uh, you know, how you actually fundamentally operate. It's not your autobiography, it's your operation manual. And one of the interesting things we could, we have the potential to do, and it's part of what does happen, um, is to take the, the advent of AI and the way networks work in the internet, and they have all these deleterious consequences we've been talking about, but they actually also afford us with some powerful ways of understanding our capacity for adapting and evolving, and potentially making that the focus. So, so this is what I've been trying to do with the reinventio of notions like faith and trust. Try to re-understand them in terms of ways in which we are accessing and accentuating our capacity uh, for relevance realization and adaptivity. Uh, because I think trying to come to a conclusion, or as Zach says, trying to identify or align with a meta-narrative that is attempting some kind of closure, I think is massively presumptuous precisely because not only are we ignorant, the rate at which we are ignorant about all of this is accelerated. And I think, the, I don't know do, uh, if this is convergent with what you're saying, Zach, it feels like it is because it feels like we, you know, we get a good understanding, one of the places where we get our best understanding of how we zero in on what's relevant, how we adapt, and how we undergo that constant evolution of our, our ability to cognitively fit to the world it is in our phenomenological interaction. I get that. I think that's one of the core moves in 4E cognitive science. But I feel like we're not saying exactly the same thing and we need to do something to get them to, to, to be closer together. Uh, I, I see the, like I say, this is generally what I, what I, I guess in broad strokes mean by getting people to try and cultivate wisdom is how can we reliably and with high plausibility and with new tools, how can we use this to really enhance people's capacity to complexify in a way that gives them an ongoing fitted response to the ongoing complexity of the world. That's where I think we should be sort of devoting our resources uh, in this situation of ultimately not knowing what the hell we are in. Uh -huh. So can I just try to say, say, say that both try to see if I can compress what you two guys are saying in my own dumb <laughs> language. Um, so so uh, what I hear Zach saying is, is a kind of a, a re return to the life world and some kind of a way and the, the, the basic realities of life. And what I hear John saying is, is that we have to become more like dancers. We have to become more flexible to, to uncertainty. And, and, um, and so, so I feel there's a, a movement towards perennialism in Zach and a movement towards futurism in, in, in John. And, and then maybe those are the two things that have to come together. But if I'm radically, if I've got that completely wrong, please let me know. Well, I liked everything except the, the, the that I, 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 it, it, I wouldn't want futurism. I would say it's, it's maybe it's, uh, I don't know what ism it is, in fact. It, it's just, a, it, it maybe it's the closest thing to stoicism is perhaps the, the ism that would come closest. In okay, the, in the sense of, uh, you know, that what, what, what you, when, when you realize that the, situ, the, the, the empire has come so complex, uh, you try to enhance your capacity to adapt 
uh, so that you can as reliably as possible act in a virtuous manner. That, that, totally. that. Yeah, and I, I think the way they would come together is I've, I think I'm leading with the space where those adaptations need to take place, like the materials and complexities that get that adaptive muscle going are other people uh, more so, or at least as much as, uh, you know, the objective world and complex problems in the objective world of adapting my physical body to it and things of that nature. And so I guess, and it may be implicit in what you're saying, but I'm saying that the, the, the place where, that adaptive capacity, it's us, we are adapting, not me adapting and you adapting, we are adapting. Totally. And so I, I think that's yeah. what I'm saying is that it's, you know, that yes, re return in a sense to the ability to always be learning and growing and like focusing on that. And, but in fact, that is always involving other people and, uh, Something like that, I think, would be the way to, to bring them together. Because I'm agreeing. It's not, in a sense, I'm not saying return to some traditional uh -huh. form of life. It's actually the opposite. I'm, I'm saying return to one another so we can figure out how to evolve together um, as, a, as opposed yeah, yeah, to staying yeah. stuck as isolated individuals all independently of like kind of in strategic evolutionary relationship. I'm saying that's a weird model and fiction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh, that in fact, the, 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 the reality is of deeply in, embedded relationality and that we are adapting. And that if I, if I adapt in a way that makes it so that you can't adapt well, that sucks. Right. So we need to, we need to co uh, I, I agree uh, with that. I think, yeah. okay. So I think that's where it comes together. I think because I think our, most significant, I mean, I think this is, it shouldn't be in any way questionable. Our most significant adaptivity is exactly our ability to um, engage sophisticated distributed cognition. That's our, that's our main way of adapting to the world. I mean, uh, our, our biggest advantage is culture, that we generate culture, which is a way in which we, we basically network brains together to make something way more synergistically powerful than they're individually capable on their own. So. I, if that's what you're talking about, if, and, and that's again why I, I think it's so important to try and replace the monological model of reason with the dialogical model of reason, that we reason mm -hmm. best in distributed cognition. And that's again where the cognitive science is pointing. It's pointing out that we reason much better in groups than we ever do individually. And, and I've, tried to make that, I've tried to make that a phenomenologically salient thing for people, that when you get into genuine dialogos with people, both people can come to places that they couldn't get to on their own, and that has an aesthetic to it. There's something beautiful. There's something lo lovely in the sense of lovable about that, and, and, and it's tremendously motivating for people. And, and this is what I mean about trying to steal the culture. If we can get people oriented towards these things so they experience reliably the motivation to want to enter into that, we, we can do something like what the Christians did to the Roman Empire. We can build a, a, an alternative culture underneath this horribly oppressive regime that eventually can actually, uh, you know, undermine it, undermine it without, you know, what you might call a political revolution or, or you know, burning things in the street. That's what I. That's what I'm really, really interested in because, uh, where, where, where there have been those moves where people, you know, uh, this is what I mean by that slogan I have. Actually, this come out right now at Cure the Dawn has, has done the meaning wave with steal the culture. That's what I mean by steal the culture. If we can, if we can get people into directly tasting and savoring what it's like to experience that overflow of rationality, and I mean that term very broadly, that is possible in distributed cognition, the way it, it enhances our adaptivity, but like with the same kind of motivational presence as the flow state does for individuals, I think that is a way of you know, weaning people off the addiction to right. the toxic aspects of social media. And you and talked I, about I, beauty too, which seems to be a very important yes. part of it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Being able to reconnect to, to beauty, right? And that's, we're yes. coming back to our, our last discussion with, um, and you, so, so that, that is, the ugliness is in the transactional relationship, right? Um, very much, uh, very much. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. sense in which, what, like, if we can get people to see, 
I'm, I'm struggling for the, it's apprehend, it's, it, it's participate in, the, 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 the fact that there is a way of being, like Socratic dialogue is not just a presentation of arguments. It is, it is, it is the seduction to a way of life. It is offering a direct experience of a way of being that's an inactive symbol for how we can be fundamentally aroused differently, care differently than we do now that can wean us off a, an addiction to, you know, well, that's what Plato's project was, an addiction to right, really disastrous social political organizations. I mean, that's why he, he saw what was happening to Athens and he wanted to create an alternative. Hmm. Beautiful. I mean, I completely agree. And uh, this is why we get along because it's such a richly educative vision. I mean, it's really about putting true, sincere inquiry, collective inquiry and engagement yeah. and kind of at the heart, near the heart of culture, like right yes. in the heart of yes. culture. Yes. yes. And yeah, that is... And then what you end up doing is you you kind of, if you want to use kind of Girardian terms, you kind of flip the direction of mimetic desire and turn yes. it towards the good. So that yeah. now what becomes mm -hmm. sexy and what people want to do and what gets their endorphins going and makes them excited ends up being something that is, uh, that actually is net beneficial to their participation in it and is much more in their control. That's the other thing you remember is that you're actually, you know, all of the mechanisms by which communication happens on social media are captured and commodified, but yeah. conversation is, is different. And to, to remove it from the realm of commodification and return it to the completely non-strategic. To the uh, real. Um, uh, the real. Yeah. And that's, yeah. and I think there's, you know, I think there is, um, there's a potency to it, you know, like mm -hmm. there, and there's a need for it actually as well. Yeah. When, you, when you think about the kind of hierarchies of needs models, you know, that need for self-transcendence and for self-actualization can only be achieved in those kinds of um, interpersonal context, dialogical context. You, you can't really actually see, achieve self-transcendence and, and self-actualization in digitally mediated, asynchronous, text-based interactions. You just, it's, it's just not going to happen. You can signal that you're, that you're post-conventional or whatever, but to actually be so richly steeped in these types of exchanges that uh, you see the fluidity of your own identity with those of others and, and, and the possibility, you said, the overflow of reason. I really like that because that's, there's an excess of reasonability and goodness right there. Um, and yeah, that's what you find in those precious contexts of the life world, like the mother child relationship, right. Or the, the legitimate, teacherly authority student teacher relationship like there are there are places where it just becomes yep. so clear that this is a species specific trait like this this way of interacting and using language and uh the mimetic um seduction to a, a different way of life as you're saying like so you there. mean like a positive kind of Im imitation so you 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 imitate your 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 you're, you're, if you're a child, you imitate your mother. If you're a student, you imi you imitate the teacher, but not copy him. You just you yeah. you, you get this transmission from him, which uh, well, imi which, I mean, which imitation raises is, the level of your own um, per perceptions and. Yeah, it's it's a basic psychological construct. Gerard got it from uh, the French psychologist Tarde, who also influenced uh, James Mark Baldwin, who influenced Piaget, and you know Baldwin's whole model and Tarde's was based on the imitations, the basic driver of personality and cognitive development mm. and but Gerard yeah yeah Gerard kind of plugged right, right into that and then noted just that violence is one of those things that is particularly imitatable and prone to be like um, mm. attractive for imitation so so the notion of mimetic violence and mimetic desire um, come out of a psychological lineage of thinking about imitation as a basic mechanism uh, but you don't have to attach imitation to violence. <laughs> like it, we imitate across the board, um, across a whole range of things. And uh, so, yeah. But is there, is there a space beyond imitation or is it just always well, what we're what doing? That's what I was talking about, Andrew. Uh -huh. You know, where Zach says flipping, uh, you know, Gerard's notion of flipping 
the direction of the mimetic desire. That's the virtue of Safrasan. Safrasan is basically at the education of your salience landscaping, so you're tempted to the good. That's what it means. It's, yeah. That's why, it's, that's why it's in contrast to Inkratia, right? Uh, yeah, I Safrasan, like that. Yeah. It, it, you're naturally tempted towards the good. And, and, and so... So it's and, making desire, it's making desire a positive and passion and and uh you know all, all the no. emotions a positive force rather than a the, rather than a <laughs> something that is turned against you and that you enact in, unconsciously to destroy that's yourself that's, and others right that's one of the things socrates claimed to know he claimed to know ta erotica which is what means he he had he had he had he had sophrosin in the sense he knew what to care about and how to care about it well mm. Mm. That's right. education again. Ah, that's really amazing, actually. I mean, that seems to be the purpose of education, knowing what to care about and how to care about it well. I mean, it, it, would you agree with that, Zach? Or? I mean, it, it should be. Yeah, that, that's what you say. What? You, say, you, say, you say your primary concern is care, um, and, and also your primary concern is education. And it just occurred to me that, you know, that, that's what education is about on the, on the most fundamental level or should be about, right? It should be. And, and it comes down to something that was said earlier about, you know, you have to be trying to solve the right problem or it's yes. not worth solving. And so, so much of education, they give you the problem and you're just supposed to solve it. Um, but the figuring out how to know what problem is a good problem to even be working on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, formulation. Right. Then, formulation. And, you know, the cultivation and clarification of desire is another way to say that. And so, you know, if, if education gives you what you want, that's like advertising, right? Again, that's, that's uh, design. It's not you get raising. a degree or something. You mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but the raising of someone isn't giving them, telling them or forcing them to solve a problem they may or may not want to solve. It's getting them equipped to think about the kind of life that they want to pursue, right. To, yeah. to frame the problem of their, of their own development. And uh, yeah, so I really like this idea of you know, tipping the balance within oneself so that you're seduced towards the good. And that's what it is. But I'm not going to tell you. And you're you. seduced towards, let's say, growth as well. Uh, yeah. And I can't tell you what's Growing good. up like a, a, a continual growth process uh, rather than, you know, you arrive somewhere. Um, right. Like it's exactly. not like enlightenment. It's, it's just continual growth. It may be. It may be in many areas, just continuous growth. Um, you know, and, and there's an important difference in terms of like values education. You know, it's not our place to actually tell you what's good for you. It's to equip you to figure out what's good for you. <laughs> um, and this is, this is so much of what some of the justice conversation hinges around. You know, it hinges around the way we are able to uh, care for one another uh, in ways that don't slide into uh, paternalism, right? And design. Um, and, and, and that's so it's, it's a critical educational issue. And it's one of the, one of the reasons that we've so problematized teacherly authority in general is that we haven't disentangled it from paternalism. Yeah. And so much education is paternalistic, you know, like so we just allowed. throw out the role models, uh, completely. Right. You throw like out I, the role I talk models. to my students and I say, like, do you have any heroes or is there anybody you look up to or that you, you know, you aspire to be like, and, and some of them say, no, you know, it's like, they don't want to have they don't want to have role models they don't want to have models they just want to be themselves but that's that's a dead end that's a um, we need this mimetic process of imitating well, and the, and the role models who yeah. are greater than and and and, and, and wiser than and, and more you know than we are who we can imitate yeah who we, we can imitate yeah. right exactly and uh, mm. yeah that's part of that disruption of intergenerational transmission is that diffusing of the potency of potential role models just across the board and uh, the retreat to the self and the screen as the locus of ideal, the formation of ideals. And, um, you know, cause if you're starting to aspire to, if you're getting your messages of what you're supposed to imitate, not from your screen, <laughs> uh, then, that, then they've lost <laughs> and you've won. So they're going to try to diffuse all the possibilities of you finding a way to shape your identity outside of that, um, that context of, of strategic uh, design. Um, so, yeah, so there's a dire need. I completely agree with John to, you know, to return to these spaces of dialogue 
and to rekindle actual teacherly authority, you know, to rekindle these contexts of real socialization and, uh, you know, deep reciprocal identity shaping. Um, yep. That would be, mm-hmm. that's it. I would say it's even, you're saying it's maybe it's deeper than the political. It's way deeper. I mean, this is an existential risk thing. Like if, if we can't figure out how to do this, then pretty much everything's lost because eventually it'll just, the inability to have real sincere, earnest collective inquiry will f- go all the way up into all echelons of institutions. And then the, you know, that one outcome is war, <laughs> right? Another the outcome war is, of all against all or whatever. Right, and another outcome is mm-hmm. just uh, the degradation of actual physical and technical infrastructures. Cause remember science runs on these, this kind of process. It has to, if, if scientists start lying to one another and everyone thinks everyone's lying to everybody, then science is actually not getting done. <laughs> uh, if, if science is, str- everyone's strategic against everyone else and buying for funds and yeah. then it's not, it's not actually science. Science requires uh, actual earnest collective inquiry. Um, and so when that's when it starts to break down the realm of science, then it's like, oh, is that nuclear reactor actually going to work or not? <laughs> like, will the electrical grid actually stay up or won't it? Uh, as things get more complicated, we actually need to preserve the space of reason to actually solve the problems to keep our basic systems running. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very serious issue. It's top, top of the list and one of the hardest to work on, <laughs> precisely because it seems... Uh, not as complicated and technical as some fancy scientific problem. It's just about finding ways to get people together. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the question of how to propagate out through the field, these kinds of practices that you're recommending, John, I think is, is essential. Um, how to create pockets and culture where that emerges as an attractor, right? Where that becomes something to imitate is, is very important. Mm-hmm. And then it doesn't become, that it doesn't lose its power or something. If things get too big, um, you know, if something becomes a movement, sometimes it, it loses its power. So there seems yeah, to no, be a size, there seems to be a, a size of, of how that can work. Like there has to be an intimate relationship with each, between each person in, in the problem that's trying to be, be, be solved. Otherwise it becomes abstract. Am I making sense here or, or am I? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think you are, but I don't think it's just a size issue because, the, we, you know, we've got evidence about metastable systems. Systems can be stable at different orders of mm-hmm. complexity. Um, I think it's more important to look at certain features. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, what's coming to mind right now is Dewey's argument about the way uh, uh, democracy is a self-correcting process and science is a self-correcting process, and therefore they need each other dramatically. Uh, but, but, but what Dewey didn't really uh, understand enough, or maybe he did, I don't want to be unfair to him, but one, one way you can um, turn this into a, uh, an issue to reflect on is well, what Dewey is presupposing is people's ability to commit to and, uh, and value a process of self-correction for its own sake. Uh, because when you, have, uh, right, when you have systems like democracy, and science in which the process within distributed cognition of self-correction is considered what is valued most rather than any particular product or result. And the systems can actually, especially if you have two of those coordinated together, then, then the structure can actually become quite large and complex without the like, sort of generating um, into the kind of thing you, uh, you're worrying about, Andrew. The right. systems are capable of metastability. Hmm. Right, but so, they need so the, to be the like, thing could be scaled like the Catholic Church, a billion people, or um, well, not, not, I don't know. I, 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 I'm <laughs> sorry, sorry to use this, use what, a more. What were you going to say, Zach? You were gonna I was going to say you like you're correct, but you have to like almost at the level of the fractal infuse the thing with the with the proper weightings of what is valued as you're saying so yeah, like exactly exactly it's, exactly it's a very very kind of complex actually cognitive value to value process over product 
right? Which is what you're saying that like the people yeah, very, very yeah, the people within democracy need to value democratic process more than they value some particular outcome. Exactly. Like that, exactly. Same with science, right? Yeah. People within science need to value the scientific exactly. process. More exactly. Than the exactly. Outcome. And so that's Dewey's underlying insight is that. And he, he took it up from Charles Sanders Peirce, who was yes. talking about yeah. the ethics of inquiry, that in fact, science depends upon things like honesty, cooperation, and selflessness. Because if you're really part of science, then you know sci when you're dead, science will change and you're contributing to something that's larger than even your lifetime. And you're kind of making a oh, yeah. you know, self-transcendent move to put your life on the altar of science, basically. It was Peirce's idea. And so, so yeah, there's a, uh, yeah, Dewey's, Dewey's point is deep, but you know it is also, as you're saying, demanding. And it's not yes. with a demand. Habermas, who was was massively influenced by Dewey as a youth, actually, uh, you know, just after World War II, some of the only reading materials in Germany were like these John Dewey books that the that the United States military brought to indoctrinate the Germans, and it really worked on <laughs> Habermas and his political theory between uh, facts and values, um, between facts and norms, rather. Uh, he makes the same move, you know, both self-regulating auto-correcting systems, science and democratic process yeah. you know, in the space of reasons, but he doesn't specify just how demanding it is cognitively to participate in those. And in exactly. terms of, in terms of the commitment. And so there's a kind of what I've called the cognitive maturity fallacy, uh, which ends up plaguing a lot of philosophy, which is the assumption that, uh, high level cognitive capacities are, are a given when they're not, they're actually an educational achievement, which may or may not be that. Exactly right. So um, I think Dewey's modeling of democracy and Habermas's basically assumes a very well functioning educational system. Um, and, you know, Dewey saw that equation and Habermas sees that equation, but I think, uh, yeah, you know, some of what you're describing, it's, it's a condition for the, the, the dialogos condition for the possibility of both science and democracy. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Zach, you, 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 you put a term to the thing I was sort of trying to articulate about the, the yeah, what was being presupposed. What, what was the, what did you, the cognitive maturity fallacy? The cognitive maturity fallacy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good. I like that. That's very tasty. That could be like IQ or something. Uh. Well, and you find it all throughout epistemology. Like when uh -huh. you read especially analytical philosophy, epistemology, oh, totally, 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 totally. things like that, they're, they're talking about like, you know, the mind as if they've never met a little kid. You know, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas Piaget is like, mm, whoa, that whole formal logic thing doesn't kick in until really late, if ever, by the way, <laughs> that people yeah, yeah. can do hypothetical deductive reasoning for real. Uh, so there's this, yeah, as a developmentalist, I was basically saying uh, the most interesting, this is a paper that I wrote, which will be out soon. I was basically saying the most, one of the most interesting things about Piaget uh, and Ken Wilber to some extent is that they don't commit the cognitive maturity fallacy that they actually yeah. model yeah. epistemology at multiple levels. Um, and, uh, and then the other factor of the cognitive maturity fallacy is that, uh, that you have achieved maturity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, One yeah, is yeah. That you assume yeah. maturity. The other is that, that there's not levels beyond your epistemology <laughs> is also part of the cognitive maturity fallacy. Uh, so it's an interesting concept, but you, you see it in political theorizing and in other places as well, where there's just an assumption that the baseline of human capacity is actually far more sophisticated and that what they're doing there, what they should actually do is, well, maybe every everything's a nail when I've got this hammer, but what they should actually do is characterize the issue as in part also an educational issue. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. That, that in fact, you know, thinking about structures of science and law and governance also requires thinking about the educational systems that produce scientists and lawyers and, and politicians. Um, uh, and if you place the bar pretty high, <laughs> uh, in, you know, no pun intended with a legal thing, if you place the bar really high and the education systems don't get people there, then you're, you failed to reproduce the, you know, the, the society. And that's one of the situations we're in. Um, so yeah, so there's a kind of a, a massive need for, psycho uh emotional cognitive triage to be run yep. across the whole bunch of areas <laughs> and uh, the thing and the things you're rolling out john seem to be some of the best stuff going you know thank you i, I should get going gentlemen uh but uh as always um but this has been wonderful um i, I really enjoyed uh zach some of the extended uh, 
I don't know what to call them. They're not speeches because that's the wrong way. But the, the extended presentations you make, because I got to see some of the depth of your thinking and uh, to really appreciate it. So I wanted to thank you for that. That was really quite wonderful at times. Mm, thank you, John. I likewise. Yeah. There's an opportunity here when we speak again to say things I wouldn't. I was like, and I think probably the same for you. You end up saying things you wouldn't say exactly, if you were exactly. speaking to somebody else. So there's a no, there's a real unique relationship. Uh, that's the that's the marker of dialogos. That's really the marker of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm honored to be sandwiched in between you two guys, and uh, uh, feel like uh, feel like there was one point where I I, I just I, I lost the thread, <laughs> but it was but it was but I was I was almost I almost had the thread, and then right towards the end I was I was I was I was losing the thread a little bit because you were going into realms which I don't particularly understand, but. Uh, um, I'm sorry, other, about that, but but no 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 problem at all. I, that's not a complaint. That's just like you guys are blowing blowing my my mind uh, as always, and that was great, as as always. All right, well, gentlemen. I'm happy to do this again. I, every time I've done this, I've found it fruitful, and Zach, you seem to find it uh, also. So yeah. um, whenever you want to do this again, consider me yeah. in. Totally. I'll get a haircut next time. I'll be looking less like the Unabomber. Not really. <laughs> no, that's perfect. <laughs> I guess. I really, got, I really got a jump, guys. Take care. Good night. Good night. See ya. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye bye.